The capricious April sun was quickly hidden by swift moving clouds. The increasing wind dampened the mood of those who had ventured out for a walk on their day off. These included elderly couples, groups of mothers with strollers, and school children enjoying their carefree break in the parks. Only eight year old Alex was not upset by the wind at all. In fact, it inspired him. After dreaming about a kite for many weeks, he finally managed to gather the necessary things and create one with his own hands. Therefore, he welcomed the windy weather. The kite, which he had obtained with great difficulty, danced high above his head in the middle of the residential area. Alex watched it with delight filled eyes until he accidentally let go of the rope. The wind immediately seized the delicate toy and whisked it away over the houses. Stop! Alex shouted in frustration, chasing after it in the hopes of retrieving his kite unscathed. But the toy, as if guided by an unseen hand, swooped right into an open window on the second floor of a grand house. A curious blond haired boy's head popped out from there a few seconds later, and then the window was abruptly shut. Alex froze in shock. Had he just lost his only toy? Hey, that's my kite! Alex protested, but his words fell on deaf ears. His disappointment knew no bounds. He had put so much time and effort into creating the toy, harbored so many expectations, that losing it was literally unbearable. Alex was already facing misfortune in his life at every turn. And he didn't want to put up with another injustice. His mother, Norma, had died a few years prior. It was unthinkable that a woman of just twenty nine could succumb to heart failure, that a cardiac attack could take her life. For the past four years, Alex had lived with his stepfather, Tom. Tom was far from the ideal family man due to his chronic alcoholism. He barely paid attention to Alex. And did not consider it his responsibility to raise him. His sole concern was the drinks. And his cruelty ran so deep that he forced Alex to beg on the streets for money, primarily to fuel his alcohol addiction. After Norman's death, Tom was unable to find the strength to overcome the tragedy. Even during Norma's life, he had been associating with harmful friends, and her death removed any remaining self restraint. You're an ungrateful brat, Alex's stepfather used to grumble. Where is your gratitude? I'm raising you, feeding you, and all you do is quarrel with me. Tom never hit Alex, but that was only because he usually couldn't catch him. The boy tried to stay out of Tom's sight, wandering the streets until nightfall, then quietly sneaking into bed to sleep. He didn't read or write much. At first, the neighbors helped the orphan by feeding him. Sharing clothes and taking him to lessons, but soon their own concerns took precedence. Alex was upset to tears and wanted his kite back. He had made it with his own hands. It was his property. Sniffling, he mustered all his courage and knocked on the door of the large wealthy house. Alex was upset when no one initially responded to his knock. He was certain he had seen a boy. Who was now hiding within the walls of his lavish home? That boy wanted to keep Alex's kite, and Alex was not going to let that happen. A few minutes later, a young woman responded. She was modestly dressed in a dark blue turtleneck and a long skirt of the same color. Her face showed no signs of kindness. She appeared both tired and unfriendly. What do you want? she asked sternly. Are you one of those beggars? How many times are you going to beg? You're becoming so audacious that you've started going door to door. Leave. We have nothing. And tell your friends not to come here again and stay away from our neighborhood. I can't stand such vagrants. You're mistaken, Alex stated firmly. I didn't come to beg. I came to retrieve my belongings. My kite flew into the window of this house on the second floor. I saw the boy who lives here take it. Despite being a wealthy household, you take other people's things. That's not fair. 
There's no kite here. Go look for it in the street, Sarah protested, not trusting the word of a stranger's child. And stop distracting decent people from their work. If you've got nothing to do, remember, normal people are working. Now, leave and don't loiter here any more. But I know you have it. Aren't you ashamed to lie as an adult? My mum always told me it's a sin to take someone else's stuff. Don't you know that? Sarah's face soured even more at Alex's words. She felt insulted by the accusation from some insignificant beggar claiming she did something immoral. Get out! If you keep loitering here, I'll call the police. I know kids like you. Are you trying to distract me while your thieving friends scout the place to rob the house? You're not welcome here. Get out! Before Sarah could slam the door in Alex's face, another woman's voice reached him. Sarah, who's there? Why are you keeping someone at the doorstep for so long? Sarah lowered her gaze and stepped back, a pretty blonde woman in a simple yet obviously expensive house dress appeared before Alex. Who do we have here? Willa Jacobson looked at Alex, giving him an affectionate smile. Sarah explained why the boy had knocked on their door, and Willa shrugged. All right, I'll ask my son and bring you your kite if we have it. Wait in the hallway. The women exchanged tense looks. It was clear that Sarah didn't like the mistress of the house though she tried to hide her feelings. Meanwhile, Willa's appearance left Alex stunned. He was speechless at the sight of her face and couldn't say a word about the purpose of his visit. The thing was that Willa looked exactly like his deceased mother. He realised it immediately but couldn't utter a word. His throat felt tight, his lips trembled, but wouldn't open to let out a single word. Alex only remembered his mother from photographs. Her image in his memory was blurred. He didn't remember her voice, only the words she repeated to him, hoping he would absorb them. Only the photo album, which Alex often looked at, reminded him of the only person who always needed him in this world. Willa had already turned to go to her son's room, when Alex, in front of a shocked Sarah, shouted, Mum! and ran after her. Stop! Sarah shouted, chasing after the boy. Stop immediately! Mummy! Mummy! Alex clung to Willa's waist. Overwhelmed, Willa gently stroked the boy's hair. I'm sorry, sweetheart, but I'm not your mum. I don't know where she is, but it's definitely not me. Calm down. Willa stood still, allowing Alex to cry. Despite his dirty and abandoned appearance, she felt a deep pity for him. Her own son, Peter, was the same age. The thought of her son suffering like this poor boy was unbearable. When Alex calmed down, Willa asked for his story. The woman didn't know whether to believe him, but she couldn't abandon the boy in the harsh weather. During their conversation, it had begun to rain heavily outside creating rivers in the streets. I'll take you home when the rain stops. Meanwhile, stay with us. I'll introduce you to my son, Willa said, smiling. Sarah will show you the bathroom. Make sure to wash your hands with soap and water before we have dinner. Do you believe me? Alex asked Willa with a hopeful tone in his voice as she rose from the couch. About my mum. I have pictures. I can prove it. We'll deal with that later, but for now, let's eat, shall we? Peter was only a year older than Alex. Despite his family's wealth and the array of toys his doting parents showered him with, he treated his new friend without any prejudice. You really made this kite by yourself? Peter exclaimed in disbelief, looking at the wind-torn cardboard kite. Wow! Of course I did. Alex responded proudly. I saw it in a magazine page that was lying on the street. I've been dreaming of making a kite ever since. I can teach you if you like. But Peter bitterly complained 
that his father wouldn't let him handle dangerous things like a hammer or nails. My dad and I make crafts for school, but they don't always trust me with scissors, the boy confessed. Both Sarah and Willa watched the children from a distance. The presence of a poor boy in the house clearly displeased the nurse. She had a distaste for the poor, considering them lazy and undeserving of sympathy. She believed that those who were jobless had chosen their lot in life. The fact that Alex was not responsible for his circumstances did not concern the haughty woman. Willa was unsure of how to handle the situation. She was against any violence against children, both emotional and physical. From what Alex had shared, she understood that his stepfather was not known for his kindness. Did you let that beggar stay in our house? Neil, Willa's husband, indignantly asked over the phone. You don't need to react like this, Willa calmly responded to Neil. The boy is not bad. He doesn't appear to be a thief, and he wasn't eyeing our house as if looking for something to steal. But can you be sure of that? And you let him stay overnight under the same roof as our son? Did you consider Peter's safety? Neil continued anxiously. Darling, calm down. Don't be so dramatic. I'll look after Alex. Sarah was helping me during the day. The boys quickly found common ground. I couldn't separate them. They're in bed now. Peter's bored. He doesn't have many friends. And the personal interaction at his age is crucial, explained Willa. He's harmless, I'm sure. Besides, our home security system is reliable. No one can enter our house at night, if that's what you're worried about. I couldn't just turn him away in this weather and send him back to his family. What do you suggest then? Neil responded tiredly. Should we keep him? Honey, you can't worry about every mistreated child in this world. You have your own family, and he, well, he's just less fortunate. After the conversation with her husband, Willa felt a lingering unease. She understood his concerns, but couldn't ignore the boy's story. Since Alex mentioned the photos of his mother, she felt compelled to verify their resemblance. In general, Neil often went away on business trips, and in his absence, Willa solved all the problems on her own without asking permission. Sarah stayed with Peter at any time when Willa needed to leave urgently. The thing was that Willa was the heiress of a huge fortune and ran the company together with her father. He gave his daughter almost all his powers, and such a job required a huge commitment from her. But despite their professional employment, Willa and Neil tried to give Peter his every free minute. Their son was desirable. He was loved, pampered, cared for and enjoyed. Let the boy from an early age had everything an ordinary child could dream of. He was not capricious and not rude to his parents. Peter loved his family very much and lived with gratitude for what he was given. Wow! How did you manage to build it so quickly? Peter exclaimed, marvelling at how Alex had built a Lego tower in just a few minutes, despite never having played with it before. The boy had a clear talent for crafts. Every project he attempted was a success. I don't know. It just happens, a bashful Alex replied. I have to watch videos on the internet, Peter responded sadly. Why don't we build together? You can do it too. The next day after breakfast, Willa had to persuade her son to stay home with Sarah. She didn't want to take Peter to talk to Tom, fearing his unpredictable behaviour due to alcohol. Mum, promise that we'll see each other again? Peter asked. OK, I promise. Willa smiled, kissed her son goodbye and said, I know you liked him. The closer Alex got to his family home, the more anxious he became. Are you scared? Willa asked, stroking his hair. I'm with you. Nothing bad will happen, I promise. It had been a long time since the boy had heard such affectionate words and encouragement. He barely remembered his mother, but Willa seemed 
to him like her reincarnation, an angel who had returned to him from heaven. Alex was fearful of his stepfather's reaction to him not sleeping at home. Tom didn't care about his stepson, but found his absence inappropriate. As soon as Alex appeared on the threshold of the house, Tom, who had not yet sobered up, came out to meet him with unsteady steps. "'Where have you been, little brat? You ran off without warning. Are you all grown up now?' the unkempt man growled menacingly. But suddenly Willa appeared before the boy, saying, "'Please, stay calm. Alex is just a child. He's scared by such behaviour. "'Oh, my goodness!' Tom exclaimed when he got a close look at the strange woman and recognised the spitting image of his late wife before him. "'Don't come near me! Get away!' he shouted, curling up in a corner. Willa approached the man who was visibly terrified. "'Relax! I'm not a ghost. My name is Willa. Yesterday Alex mistook me for his mother. He promised to show me a photo, which is why I'm here. I wanted to see if I truly resemble your late wife. Tom, embarrassed by his earlier panic, regained his composure. He was used to appearing stern and intimidating, but he had lost control in front of a stranger. Nobody invited you here, he declared. Get out of my house. There's nothing I want to show you. Don't yell at me, Willa, unafraid of the drunkard's loud voice, retorted quietly. If you get out of control, I'll call the police. You can't intimidate me, and you won't harm Alex again, or else you'll regret it, be certain of that. And by the way, isn't this Alex's mother's house? He has a right to bring guests here. Luckily, Tom decided against escalating the conflict. He slumped into a rickety armchair and dozed off, while Alex quickly found an old photo album and showed it to Willa. Amazing! The woman looked at Norma's photo with amazement and couldn't believe her eyes. Even at a young age, they were strikingly similar. Not exactly like twins, but they could easily be mistaken for sisters. Do you believe me now? Alex asked, noticing the impact of the photos. You're right. I've never seen anything like this before. Willa realised that her resemblance to the late Norma couldn't be a mere coincidence. There could be only a handful of people on the planet who looked so much like her, but in the same city? Willa couldn't determine the appropriate conclusion, so she decided to ponder everything calmly at home. Alex, how would you feel about living with me and Peter for a while? I'm not sure how I'm related to your mum yet, but it's something we need to figure out. With overnight stays, wondered the boy. He didn't believe in the fairy tales that children loved because he feared getting too attached to kind people. Life had already taken his mother from him, left him with his stepfather and forced him to beg. Alex did not want to hope in vain. With overnight stays, Willa confirmed. I can't promise more yet, but you need to live here. I don't know how this will end. But you certainly won't live with your stepfather. He's incapable of caring for you. If necessary, I'll contact the guardianship authorities, and they'll find you a good family. But that's a last resort. Alex didn't want to go to an orphanage or to another family, but he also didn't want to stay with Tom. Instead, he enjoyed spending time with Willa and Peter. At home, his new friend welcomed him with joyous shouts. The boys immediately retreated to a makeshift house made of chairs and blankets, where they spent the day in their own world. "'Mrs. Jacobson, will you really let him stay?' Sarah asked, disdainfully wrinkling her nose. "'This is my house, and my decision. I don't need your opinions,' Willa retorted, and went to her office to catch up on the paperwork she had been putting off. Willa was certain that Peter would enjoy Alex's company. Peter was a diligent pupil, involved in various activities, but his shyness hindered his social interactions. Alex's life was less guarded 
but he was more vivacious, sagacious, so he could help to loosen up his new friend. After his first week at Willa's house, Alex had mixed feelings. Willa treated him as she did her own son. For the first time in years, he enjoyed delicious meals, had plenty of toys, and received care. He even had new clothes. Willa tutored him, noticing his strength in math, but struggle with reading. The only downside was the presence of Sarah, whose oppressive demeanour cast a dark shadow over him. He could not understand why he was subjected to such treatment. Pack all the toys immediately, Sarah would hiss at him, taking pleasure in yanking his ears. I'll teach you gratitude. You're not the Lord here. Clean up after yourself. Let go. It hurts, Alex would whimper, but Sarah seemed to revel in his discomfort. She never missed a chance to chastise him behind Willa's back, treating Peter quite differently. She never raised her voice at Peter, forced him to do anything, nor demanded gratitude from him. However, despite Sarah's resentment towards him, Alex still enjoyed living with Peter and Willa. Recently, Willa found it tough to concentrate on her work, as her thoughts revolved around Alex and Norma. She started to investigate who the boy's late mother might have been, and what could link them. Just be careful, Neil, who was away on business, warned her. Don't trust everything you hear. Verify everything. I don't want you to put yourself in danger. I'll come and help you as soon as I can. Thanks, honey, Willa replied, a smile in her voice. I miss you a lot. My head is spinning from all this. She admitted to the person who always respected her viewpoint, even when he didn't agree with it. I'll update you as soon as I find out anything. First, Willa decided to delve into her past. Looking for answers to her tormenting questions, she visited her parents. They moved to the country, quiet cottage village, after gifting their house to their daughter Willa when she got married. This peaceful environment and the shared hobby of gardening helped them to live calmly. Daughter, what's wrong? Fabrizio asked, perplexed by her serious look. Your call scared your mother and me. Dad, I need to have an important conversation with you. Let me explain everything. After learning why she had come, the elderly couple was stunned. Evelyn covered her face with her hands, hiding her tears and shame, while Fabrizio looked guilty. Well, why are you silent? I'm already all on edge. And you're adding to my worries, Willa exclaimed, upset. She had just realised that her parents had kept a secret from her for years. Oh, daughter, forgive us. We should have told you everything earlier, Evelyn replied, wiping her face with a handkerchief. Your father and I struggled for a long time without children. We were going to adopt the child, but then one day Fabrizio learned that the wife of his acquaintance had recently given birth to twins. The girls were nearly identical. Times were hard and the woman was poor. She didn't know how to raise two children at once. That's why Helena agreed to let us take one. She gave you to us and swore she'd never tell anyone about it. That's how she got Norma and we got you. Initially, Willa silently regarded her parents. She looked into her father's eyes as if searching for confirmation. Finally, she realised that her mother had told her the truth. She wasn't their biological child, although she had never doubted their familial bond. So you just bought me? You traded me for something? That's... that's crime, Willa said in disbelief. Yes, we offered her financial help. She couldn't handle two young daughters because of her own family problems. Her husband had left her pregnant. Plus, in such case, she could be sure that you would grow up in good conditions. She continued to converse with her parents, absorbing every word. However, neither Fabrizio nor Evelyn heard from Norma's family again, nor did they reappear seeking help. The families lived their separate lives. 
Willa understood one thing. She is responsible for Alex now. She once had a sister, her only blood relative, and now she only had Alex. She would not return him to his stepfather, nor leave him in an orphanage. Such options were unthinkable. Willa accepted him as her second son and had no intention of letting him go. She wasn't short of money, and she had enough love for a second child. She would manage with everything. Well, guys, Willa announced to the children upon returning from the cottage village. It turns out that Norma and I are sisters, and you are all real blood relatives. Can you believe what an unpredictable fate? It brought us all together. It's all because of the kite, Alex interjected. If it hadn't flown into your window, we would never have met. Exactly, Willa laughed. Now we'll all live together. When my husband returns, we'll discuss adoption, and I'll start collecting the necessary documents. So, Alex, congratulations. You are now part of our family. Willa opened her arms to the boy, and he immediately embraced her. Thank you, thank you, he repeated through tears. He felt loved, appreciated, and cherished once again. Sarah, however, was disturbed by the changes taking place in the mansion. She was not really a nanny, but was acting on the orders of Fabrizio's old rivals. She was sent to bring chaos and harm to the family. For several months, Sarah had been working at Neil and Willa's house to gain their trust. She did not particularly like children, but she carried out her duties flawlessly. Peter's parents had no complaints about her, although the boy himself often felt her coldness. Sarah had free reign in the luxurious house, including access to Neil's office, desk and safe. She would often sneak in to gather information and pass it along. This behaviour posed a threat to the family business, yet Willa didn't know it yet. Sarah's second plan, however, would have excited the lady of the house much more. She intended to seduce Neil, breaking up the family and causing turmoil in the couple's relationship. But so far she could not compromise the decent man, who was often travelling and did not pay the slightest attention to the strict but attractive nanny of her son. But Sarah was not to be underestimated. She had a trump card. Alex, who had been living in Willa's house for the first week, had quickly settled in and made himself comfortable. But Neil's return from a business trip unsettled the boy. The owner of the house was not pleased about the new kin, and often reproached his wife for her haste. Did you even take him to the clinic for a check-up? Who knows what he may have picked up living in his old house? You told me yourself how unsanitary it was. Neil was growing increasingly agitated. Of course, I looked after my nephew's health, and I don't want to discuss this any further. Alex's family, and I will never abandon him, whether you approve or not. Willa responded firmly. Neil understood that arguing with her was futile. He was cautious around the boy, offering minimal attention, despite recognising that Alex posed no threat to his family. "'Your dad doesn't like me,' Alex expressed sadly. "'He's a good man, I know. My dad has never hurt me. He loves me, Mum, and he'll love you too. He might seem stern, but he's not. He'll adjust. Just wait and see.' As time passed, the stringent Neil began to soften. He was spotted more frequently, spending time with the boys. He would transform into a child himself, racing around the house playing hide-and-seek, kicking a ball in the yard, and participating in archery contests, using a plastic bow with silicon-tipped arrows. "'You've tortured me, guys. I need some rest,' Neil exclaimed collapsing onto the living room couch. "'Dad, get up, we haven't finished the game yet,' Peter urged, tugging on his arm. "'Give me five minutes,' Neil panted, trying to catch his breath. 
Alex was no longer afraid of his new uncle, but he noticed something the others did not. Sarah's duplicity. She was often rude to him when they were alone, but he never complained to Willa or Neil. They already had enough to worry about. However, around Neil, Sarah always changed. She became pleasant and accommodating, presenting herself as vulnerable and always ready to help. She seemed offering an understanding that Neil didn't always find with Willa. Alex had noticed Sarah frequently visiting his uncle's study during his absence. One day, the boy dared to peek through the keyhole. He saw Sarah rifling through Neil's desk, examining and photographing the contents of some folders. Upon witnessing Sarah in Neil's office again, Alex immediately rushed to inform Willa. Aunt Willa, he burst into the room where his aunt was engrossed in paperwork. What's the matter? Why are you so flustered? Sarah was going through Uncle Neil's desk. I saw it with my own eyes, I swear, Alex exclaimed. Really? Willa found it hard to believe. She had never observed such behaviour from Sarah before. After all, Sarah's role was to look after the children, not to be in the study. It's not the first time. She's always in there, taking photographs. Willa became serious. Initially, she thought Alex was letting his imagination run wild, but his statement now concerned her. Sarah has been working for us for a long time, and we trust her. There's no need to slander a person, Willa said sternly. Alex immediately fell silent. He wasn't believed and didn't know how to prove his point. When Neil returned from his business trip, he gathered everyone at home in one room. Someone has been going through my desk. I don't know who it was, but the papers are not in order. Nothing's missing, but I don't like it. Peter, I've told you many times not to go into my study. It's not a playground or an entertainment space. Children shouldn't be in there. I didn't, the son blurted out immediately. Willa and Alex exchanged glances at that moment. Sarah's been in there a few times, Alex stated, causing anger and confusion to flash across the nanny's face. And I told you that boy would be nothing but trouble. The woman retorted calmly, not making any excuses but attempting to counter Alex's accusation with her authority. All of them, they come from the streets, thieves and beggars. You know his past life. He has a history of stealing and begging for money on the streets. I've seen it in my previous job. Neil looked at his nephew with doubt. Even though he had accepted the fact that he and his wife now had to raise two sons, he was not going to tolerate stealing. Is it true? Did you enter my study? Alex began to shake. He did not know how to justify himself. After all, he had no proof. Sarah had skillfully deflected suspicion away from herself and was now looking down at the child with gloating. I have nothing to do with it. I'm not a fool. I don't want to go to an orphanage. I have enough of everything. I wouldn't sneak into anywhere. Alex spoke confidently, but his eyes were already filled with tears. That's enough. Willa stood up for her nephew. If it is not known exactly who was in the office, it is not worth pressuring the child. She walked up to Alex and pulled him close. He had gone soft, felt her pity, and hid his face behind his aunt. But Neil was not going to let the situation go. When the spouses were in their bedroom, he immediately began a conversation, not hiding his discontent. I do not trust him. I know you stand up for him, but after all, he partly lived on the street. We don't know how he was brought up, what his moral principles are. He can be a bad influence on our son. Willa crossed her arms over her chest, rejecting her husband's viewpoint. You've been home for almost a month. Tell me, has Alex seemed immoral, violent, or restless to you? 
No, you know very well he's incapable of such behavior. In fact, he told me about the situation himself. Last week, he said he saw Sarah going through your papers. No way, Neil recoiled. He could have fabricated this story a long time ago. Maybe he's framing Sarah as a part of his plan. I don't even want to hear it. Alex is innocent, and I won't reprimand him without cause, Willa retorted, heading to bed in a foul mood. She would never betray Alex or entertain her husband's suspicions. Neil didn't know the boy well enough to judge him, but Willa would never believe her nephew capable of dishonesty. To clear Alex's name and reveal the true culprit, she decided to install a hidden camera in her husband's study. Willa kept her plan a secret, not even informing Neil. She herself began to suspect Sarah, noticing the woman intentionally avoided the ill-fated office. Taking advantage of Neil's absence, Willa decided it was time to catch the thief. Sarah, please feed the boys when they return from school. I'll be gone for four hours at the most. Don't give them any sweets. Alex already has allergies. Of course, Mrs. Jacobson, Sarah replied, glad to have the house all to herself. Lately, she had to be careful and remain unfazed when people gave her strange looks. She wanted to get back at Alex, but she couldn't. If she took her anger out on the boy, everyone would discover her true identity. Willa sat in her car, parked behind the house, watching her phone screen. It displayed images from the cameras installed in Neil's study. Not long after Willa got comfortable, Sarah showed up. On the phone screen, it was clear that Sarah stealthily entered the room and calmly examined the documents left on the desk. She took a picture of them and then opened the desk drawer she had rummaged through before. Willa had persuaded Neil against installing locks on the drawers. If they were harder to access, Sarah would stop visiting the study, but Willa was keen on catching her. Now, Willa had the evidence she needed to imprison Sarah and find out who was spying on her family. If it weren't for Alex's attentiveness, they could have suffered huge losses. To scare the thief, Willa hurried back into the house and quietly came to her husband's study. At this moment, she encountered Sarah emerging from the room. I caught you red-handed, Willa said, struggling to hold back her anger. I was watching you, and now you can't get away with it. Sarah quickly composed herself, returning to her arrogant demeanour. So what? I didn't steal anything. You can't prove anything. Leave my house now. We'll take legal action. You won't get away with this. Don't you dare come near my children again. I'll leave, Sarah smirked, seizing the last chance to hurt Willa. But your Neil is going with me. Expecting a baby? We've been together for six months, and you, poor fool, had no clue. Willa was so furious, she nearly lunged at Sarah, who laughed, pleased with her own cruel joke. I better leave before you become violent. I need to protect our baby. Willa felt as if she had been drenched in ice-cold water. The news about the baby left her dumbfounded. Sarah rushed to leave the house. She was acutely aware of the danger she was in. Meanwhile, Willa was consumed by a singular concern. Impossible. Neil would never... I would have noticed. These thoughts churned in Willa's mind, causing a wave of nausea. It seemed unthinkable, yet she couldn't dismiss the possibility. With trembling hands, she dialed her husband's number. Did something happen between you and Sarah? she demanded. Willa, what? What are you talking about? Why does your voice sound odd? Neil responded, clearly confused. You and Sarah, were you together or not? Willa persisted. Of course not. 
Why would you ask that? Neil replied, laughing, but Willa didn't share his humour. Get home now. We need to talk, Willa said firmly, unwilling to discuss this matter over the phone. While waiting for her husband, she struggled to reconcile the idea of Neil being unfaithful. She couldn't believe she had been deceived for months. Neil had never given her a reason to be jealous before. Their relationship had always been one of strength and honesty. They had faced many challenges together, but infidelity had never been one of them. Willa had never shown interest in other men, and her friends reassured her that Neil only had eyes for her. She had never questioned Neil's loyalty, taking it as a given. They had weathered many storms together, not just as spouses and lovers, but as friends. Neil indefinitely postponed all business and hurried to the airport. He didn't understand why Willa had questioned him. He tried to reach Sarah, but she didn't answer the phone, leaving him in the dark. Neil arrived home when the boys had already finished their homework and were preoccupied with their game console. There was nothing to stop the adults from having their discussion. Willa! Neil exclaimed when he saw his wife's condition. What's wrong? You look so pale! He attempted to caress Willa's cheek, but she turned away. I know it's not true. You wouldn't betray me. But Sarah said... said she was pregnant with your child. Willa sobbed. God, please tell me she's wrong. I want to believe you, but it hurts so much. What did she say? Is she out of her mind? Neil asked in disbelief. Why did she say that? What was Sarah trying to achieve? I had never viewed my son's nanny in that way. I love you, my lawful wife. I didn't need a replacement. You realise she's lying, right? You caught her stealing, and she decided to sting you. She wanted to hurt you and get revenge, he explained to Willa. I love only you, and have only been with you. I don't want any other woman. We don't even know if she's truly pregnant or just making it up. We need to find out who she works for. Willa, honey, believe me, I only want you. I value our family. You're everything to me. Willa had needed to hear these words from her husband. She broke down in his arms, crying like a child. She had been distressed for hours, but now she felt relieved. No matter what Sarah was planning, they would resolve it together and not let a liar ruin their marriage. But Willa's hopes were dashed when Sarah's pregnancy was confirmed. This revelation significantly changed her relationship with Neil. How many times must I tell you that I'm not involved? Neil defended himself. I'm not the father of her child. If you like, we make a DNA test. That's easy. Of course I want to, Willa responded immediately. I do, but we can't do it until after the baby is born. I can't bear it. God! So you don't believe me, after all? The husband exhaled tiredly. He was exhausted from defending his reputation. There was neither proof of his guilt nor evidence of his innocence. You're turning into a paranoid... If you love me, you'll believe me right away. But you believe some crook who stole our documents? Willa realised that her husband was right. He had never betrayed her trust before, but now she was ready to believe the words of a criminal. She couldn't endure a few more months living with her husband under the same roof. I can't play happy families with you until this whole nightmare is over. I can't embrace you. I don't trust you any more. Only a test can calm me down, Willa confessed. And I can't stay under the same roof with you, or I'll go crazy. We're going to my parents' house with the kids tonight. No, no, stay here. All the boys' things are here. I'll leave. But that's not an admission of guilt, Willa. I'm hurt that you can think I'm capable of treason. When the results come out, then we'll talk. No matter how tough Neil 
tried to appear. Willa's distrust hit his self-esteem hard. He tried to track down Sarah to demand answers from her, but she seemed to have vanished. With no one else to vent his anger on, the man began to blame himself. He thought that all this could have been avoided if he had spent more time at home, if he had treated Alex better and believed his words. Overwhelmed by hatred and guilt, Neil began to drown his sorrows in alcohol. His appearances at the company office became less frequent as he delegated his duties to his deputies. It became increasingly difficult to catch him sober or to expect sound professional advice. Do you not communicate with Neil at all? Her mother asked Willa gently. No, replied Willa. He drinks, and I don't want anything to do with it. Daughter, you're making a big mistake, Evelyn said, placing her hands on Willa's shoulders and kissing her forehead. Let go of your anger and listen to your heart. The boys miss him. I don't have time for Neil. He's neglected the company and I can't handle it alone. Daddy helps a bit, but he's been out of the game for a long time. Neil was in charge of the deals, and now I don't know what to do, Willa said, waving her hands in frustration on the verge of tears. Whoever was behind Sarah, they had achieved what they wanted and brought discord into the family. Evelyn understood the difficulties her stubborn daughter faced. She and Fabrizio had raised her to be independent and business-minded, but sometimes this worked against her. However, Willa needed her mother's advice and decided to follow her heart, trust Neil, and seek the truth in her situation. She hired a private detective and immersed herself in work, anxiously awaiting the investigation's results. Bradford visited her after the first week of work. So soon? Willa asked, surprised as she let him in. They weren't very good at hiding. Your enemy is serious but foolish, Bradford smirked. The whole family gathered to hear the detective's report. Fabrizio and Evelyn could barely sit still. Your business enemy is Gary Slezak. I don't know a Gary, but I am familiar with a Ben Slezak, Fabrizio said, seated comfortably. He worked for me for a long time before you were born, the man said to his daughter. Correct. Gary is his nephew. Ben held a grudge after being fired. He believed he was let go unfairly, not due to his work but for personal reasons. Well, we were on good terms, but Ben always made me uneasy. He seemed to be a bit of a rotten man, Fabrizio added. And then it was confirmed. Evelyn nodded, gripping her spouse's hand. She knew she had to disclose another secret. Fabrizio fired him for abandoning his pregnant wife, Helena, who was expecting twins. Can you believe it? They weren't certain, but that's what the doctors suspected. I assumed if he isn't devoted to his family, he wouldn't be loyal to his superiors, Willa's father said. Wait, Helena? My birth mother? Willa immediately frowned. Yes, dear, that's her. Out of compassion, we took you from her. It was a decision that benefited everyone, Evelyn confirmed. Bradford glanced around at the gathered individuals and continued his tale. In retaliation, Ben opened his own company and slowly started to attract clients. The growth was slow but steady, showing no signs of failure. Ben then changed, wanting to return to Helena and his family, but she refused to have anything to do with him after his leaving her. He started drinking, quickly spiralling downwards. He lived a solitary life for several years and died alone. His company was then inherited by Gary. Is he stirring up all this water? Willa asked. Are we related? Does he know about it? Unlikely, Bradford shrugged. But it's possible to find out. No need. I'll do it myself. Willa stopped him. Thank you for your work. It's much clearer now. In an attempt to save her marriage and business, Willa decided to write to Sarah 
and arrange a meeting with her at any cost. She was the only link between her and Gary. For a fair price, she could reveal a lot of interesting information about him. However, as soon as she contacted her former nanny, Sarah burst into tears. That jerk abandoned me like unwanted garbage. It's in their blood. They're all liars, cried the distraught pregnant woman. He left me. How could I fall for that? Sarah, wait. Who left you? Gary, Sarah drawled, glad someone was willing to listen. Willa's heart skipped a beat. Apparently, Sarah was pregnant with Gary's child, so there was nothing to connect her with Neil. No matter how much she wanted to triumph now, Willa decided to give Sarah the comfort of pulling out more information about Gary. He had no right to do that to you. He has to pay for everything, Willa kept saying, knowing that a vindictive woman like Sarah would not simply accept her fate, but would seek revenge. I will not let him live in peace. I'll tear his soul out. Sarah spat out curses, but Willa suggested a simpler way. Let's get the IRS on him. You must know a lot about what he's doing. Send an anonymous tip. Things were improving. Neil's name was cleared, and Gary was escorted out of the firm's building in handcuffs two days later. All documents and electronic media were seized for inspection. Willa visited Gary in the pre-trial detention centre and revealed that they were siblings. We could have united and become the most influential in the central region, but you ruined everything. Uncle didn't tell me anything and I didn't know, replied a clearly puzzled man, but his regret didn't change anything. The man should have faced the law. Meanwhile, Willa worried that her husband would be cold and aloof during their meeting. Yet when they saw each other, knowing the truth was out, both rushed forward with open arms. Forgive me for everything. I beg you, Willa repeated as Neil held her close spinning in the air. I'll never leave you again. God, I missed you so much. Where are the kids? I want to hug them. They're at my parents, Willa laughed heartily. I'm sorry for not trusting you. I shouldn't have pushed you away. We could have worked it out together. I'm sorry too. I shouldn't have given up. You tackled the firm and the kids and unraveled the situation while I just wallowed in self-pity and drank all the time. It must have been a test of our strength, suggested Willa, not letting go of her husband's hand. Let's go get the kids. I can't wait to see them. Neil and Willa spent a long time discussing what had happened. They vowed to each other that they would never hide from problems or take offence without evidence. They were confident they could now face any challenge together. Quiet, he's still asleep, Peter whispered, peeking into Alex's room and put a finger to his lips. We need to light all the candles, Neil began to light each of the nine candles on the birthday chocolate cake Willa was holding. The family entered the room of the sleeping birthday boy, singing a joyful birthday song. Happy birthday, son, Neil stroked Alex's hair and kissed his cheek. Happy birthday, little brother, shouted Peter, pointing at the cake. Hurry up and make a wish. I already have everything I want, Alex said, his eyes welling up with tears. I have a real family. I love you all very much. Although, if we were to have a little sister, I wouldn't say no. He blew out the candles and, smiling, winked at Willa. <laughs>